I hope we can all see my screen over here. Um, we can see you. Um, oh. I don't think you're sharing your screen. Oh, wait. All right. There we go. Yes, I can see it. All right. Yeah. Thanks for everyone attending this event. And um, my name is Robert, as I was introduced, and I'm a process simulation engineer in Malex. And today I'd like to present everyone how we in Malex benefit from using FlexSim within our manufacturing cross-functional teams. Um, so at first, I'd like to introduce our company quick. Uh, Malex, uh, most probably uh, lots of you uh, use random electronic devices, uh, no matter what it be, laptops, cars, or anything else. And lots of these things that you use in daily life might have uh, Malex electronic components. Uh, Malex is a company with uh, more than 40,000 employees worldwide, 83 manufacturing locations, and then more than 100,000 uh, products in, in the lineup. And uh, we are one of the top three interconnect companies in the world. So Malex focuses on very different fields, uh, variety of industries, including data communications, medical, industrial, and automotive, and consumer electronics. My team specifically is based in Rochester Hills, Michigan, and our primary, primarily focused on the automotive business unit of Molex. Uh, we also work with other business units, but it really depends because we don't have as big of a team to support all units. So whenever we have uh, work to do, we always focus on automotive first and then everything else. So in terms of the project that I want to present you, uh, we have a manufacturing assembly line and uh, it has some background that it already existed before we simulated it. And uh, here you can see the example with videos of uh, what it was originally. Basically, it's a automated assembly line and uh, it was initially operated in manual way and most of the material flow or almost all of it was completed by operators. And um, then we decided to simulate that old process first in order to uh, do some kind of model verification and make sure that Flexim can output reasonable data and then it kind of fits the real world. And this was a very good reference for us and uh, a good project at first to test it out, how to work together with Flexim. And then once we uh, figured out how all processes work in real world, we modeled everything. As you can see, there are lots of low level things happening with operators uh, all around the model. Uh, we decided to improve this assembly line and uh, started and decided to create a newer version of the model and basically updated it where we could include uh, something like AGVs or any other uh, ways to improve the current process and maybe reduce the manual work as much as we can. So going on from here, the simulation objective was to reduce WIPs around the assembly line, predict the throughput with different material flow methods, plan an optimal test sequence approach for all operators or AGVs, create a better scheduling strategy for material supply, and estimate the total number of tools and space required to uh, satisfy the schedule, evaluate material flow transportation methods, and then lots of other very low level processes that I'm not going to cover right now because there are really lots of things that you can optimize even within operator test sequence or uh, AGV test sequence. Even regarding AGVs, we put uh, a lot of time optimizing things like charging logic because with different vendors, there are always different um, 
parameters that you can optimize, such as charging time, the time when HGV can go to charge, the minimum time of charging and things like that. And we try to consider as many things as possible to make it as close to real world as possible. And here we have a small uh, overview of what we modeled and what we have not modeled. In terms of what's modeled in this project is um, material and final good flow in the assembly workshop that you've seen before. Then the jobs of preparing components such as packaging transit and everything else regarding that. Then machine breakdown, changeovers, maintenance, rejects. More, most of this data was taken from the uh, assembly line that was already in operation. So this data was as realistic as we could get. And then all, all the low level logic as I described before. But at the same time, you can't model literally everything. And uh, some of the things were of course obviously missed such as HGV obstacles on the path or some other blocking conditions for HGVs. Let it be a, a box uh, in the shop or anything else. More very low level details about the machines and stations. And then we haven't modeled the warehouse itself because it's another very big separate process. And then some other maybe more specific logics besides that. So here you can see a new improved model layout compared to what I showed you before. Here I can give you more specifics of what, what it looks like and what's happening around it. So here it, uh, on the right upper corner, you can see packaging material storage area. That's where operators are walking and preparing packaging materials according to the product. Oh, as, and as it's mentioned here, assembly line has 20 stations for two different products. So at the moment we're running two products, but in the future, there is a chance that the number of products may increase and or some of the process may change. And then um, on our lower right corner, you can see the material preparation area. That's where the raw material is being prepared, such as uh, which is going to be transferred later to the assembly line itself. As you can see that covered with the yellow color. And um, basically this process uh, originally was completed by operators. And then here you can see with red color, we have AGV paths instead now. And then we have packaging process at the end of the assembly line. So after material is loaded to the assembly line one, then it can be transferred to the assembly line two, depending on the product, of course. And maybe some products have to be loaded to the assembly line two directly or some of the raw components, depending where these raw components are required to be used. As you can see, the paths uh, kind of enter and exit certain stations. That means that specific components are required at certain stations only that, and they need to be transferred uh, on time. And uh, everything has to be kind of collaborating together, I'd say. <laughs> um, all right, so here I have a few videos of how all of it was working together as a final process. Oops, sorry. Uh, let me try to start off it if I can. So you can see that at the material preparation process, operators have their task sequence that's happening. And then at the packaging process, there is a very specific task sequence involved with operators. Then there are operators at some specific stations when it's needed. And uh, there is always something happening and almost every single station, I'd say. <laughs> and then AGVs were transporting raw materials, so products all over, the, all over the floor. You can see here with the red, there's AGV. Uh, yeah, I can maybe scroll through. And that's the packaging area over here. That's the raw material preparation area. 
you can see the mo model is a bit lagging because uh, there is lots of 3Ds that are included in there to be more specific and precise. And then uh, lots of logic behind everything. So the model has been slowing down because of that. And that, that was as fast as I was able to record <laughs> the process. All right, so going on from here, I just wanted to share the process flow logic behind the model. Um, it's quite sophisticated because we, as I mentioned before, we tried to consider as much things as we could. And um, here you can see things like AGV control module, like over here, we have logic. We try to keep it documented and organized and modular. So in a way that we try to make sure that the model itself, itself stays modular in case if we want to increase the number of HEVs and then we don't have to uh, kind of code it or update the whole process flow just for this one parameter. And uh, in that way, that logic can be a little bit more complicated, but it's so worth it. <laughs> and then uh, things like manual op operations control, things including operators or any manual work, then packaging module, there is like whole logic for packaging uh, all over around their material supply logic and all the initial settings. In terms of initial settings, this uh, logic in the process flow is included in order to make sure that we can use experimenter and all parameters are considered around the model. And then whenever we change some parameters in uh, parameter table for experimenter, the whole model will be updated accordingly. Yeah, basically we focus for it to be as modular as we can in terms of process flow. So coming down to flexing benefits, um, I want to give you small examples of how flexing was beneficial for us in order to find any bottlenecks or issues around the model. Of course, we use dashboards for, to track everything in terms of states or any other parameters. Um, here, I just shortly described the process that we followed. Let's say we, oops, sorry. I, yeah, here. We verify that all stations operate without issues in the design process and then run the simulation model or experimenter depending on what we try to analyze with different inputs to find potential problems and then think about how to resolve them. Here, I give a small example of how one of the stations uh, was getting blocked and then all other states are being tracked throughout the stations. So what it means block, blocked means when, um, let's say there are three stations, the station, Two has finished processing the material and then it needs to go travel to the station three, but the station three is already processing material. And then the station one has also finished processing the material. And that means that station three, like station two is being blocked by that uh, part that can't move to the station three. So that means it's in a block state and then it's a bottleneck. So we try to track it. On, on top of it, we check, uh, how much the all the operators or other task executors travel, how efficient they are. If we need to optimize them, we track their utilize the overall utilization, how much if it's if it comes down to AGV, we'll track how much they're charging, how much they travel. And then uh, together with the team, we can come down with a conclusion on how to fix it, check it, and then pro and include different inputs in experimenter or in a regular simulation. So here I explain how we optimize the parameters in that way. Uh, all right, so I'll go to the next slide. So in terms of simulation outputs, here you can see some of the charts that we've had in this specific model. Of course, there are way more of them. I just tried to pick some of them to give you some kind of an idea what we track. Um, 
As I mentioned, we track utilization for all possible test executors across the model, let it be operators or HVs. And uh, we try to include all possible states for them, charging and uh, unloading, loading, waiting for transit blocks, block states and everything. Then uh, we track utilization of each station in the assembly line, as I showed you before. Then uh, all travel distances, then battery levels. Battery levels can be tracked when we try to set up appropriate HV charging logic, for example. And uh, it can really vary depending on case by case. Here is just an example. And basically depending on how, how much we want to check and track, we can include as many dashboards as we want. Um, so surely speaking, in terms of the uh, help from Flexim, uh, I can give you a small summary of what we were able to improve from the original layout and the process that we've had over here at the top to the current process, process that has been updated in the real world and that we're using now. Um, in terms of material flow, we we're able to reduce the number of operators uh, in the production area per shift from 14 to 10. Then all of the excessive operators were replaced by two AGVs. And uh, assembly line throughput has been increased by 20% after uh, considering all improvements and completing them. On top of it, as I mentioned in a simulation objective in the beginning, we were able to save a lot of floor space uh, in the area, which is quite important for 5S management and uh, all the lean practices. We don't create any waste. It's way more organized compared to what it used to be. And the layout is way better besides, besides the improvement of material flow on top of it. We were able to confirm the benefits of automation. Uh, we established a new production schedule for all products. AGV fleet was sized appropriately and uh, lots of other low level process has been updated as well, such as charging logic. And um, a small uh, kind of comment about this model overall, we try to focus that whenever we, if we want to improve this project in the future, let's say that we'll have more uh, products that will be running through the assembly line, which, is, which can be always the case because the product line can, can expand and we may need to use the same assembly line for other products or that we'll be using some specific stations in the assembly line. We try to make sure that we keep the model modular so we can add extra parameters and these parameters won't break any logic uh, to everything that already exists. And that could be a challenge sometimes, but that's what makes it pretty efficient, especially when we use it with experimenter or optimizer. Um, I guess, and that's all. <laughs> I, I, I'm ready to answer any questions. I try to go over it as quick as, quick as I can <laughs> and uh -huh. explain it more in a high level way. So feel free to ask any questions. Excellent, yeah, and we do have a few already. Um, the first one, did you use uh, the AGV network or the A-star algorithm for this model? So for this specific model, we used um, uh, AGV network because as I mentioned before, we don't track any obstacles on, on the floor. And for that reason, we developed the uh, uh, paths as I uh, show here. And it, it really depends on AGVs that we use because when we talk to different vendors, we make a conclusion what's uh, a better approach to take, whether to use A star or AGV paths. So, with the vendors that we stayed in touch for this project, we made a decision that it's better to use AGV paths because they may be following uh, a, like a, a line, a certain, a certain like path that's been pre programmed or following some lines with the laser. So, for this project, we went with AGV paths, but in some cases we test A star as well. So when we even 
start the project before we know what's the vendor and what's going to be the final way. We try to even consider simulating both ways before finalizing the model. Excellent. Um, another question here, uh, how did you manage the logic for AGV? Uh, which logic, sorry? The charging, so the, the battery charge for, for AGV, the logic there. Yeah, so some of the things we used from the standard HEV network logic uh, that, that you provide, which is things like idle time use or travel loaded use or travel empty battery use. And then you, you have some standardized logic for battery capacity. We use that as a default in this model, for example, but then on top of it, we build that kind of module ourselves, which includes lists. And whenever we get a task for HV, the task gets pushed, pushed to the list. And then we have a trigger when the task has been received on the list. We then check uh, if there is any available HV. If, it's, if there is, then we check uh, the closest one. If there is one or two, then we check the distance of HV to the task maybe sorted by the shortest distance, like with queries. Uh, if there is no AGV, then we push it to another area and then we check if there is AGV ch at charging. And if there is AGV at charging token, for example, or charging area, then we can preempt it in case if uh, it's battery level above a uh, certain threshold, let's say. So we kind of build it manually. I know you have templates, but, uh, this worked better for us and kind of we already set up a certain way that we we use in most of our models at this point now the same way and it works out for us yeah excellent thank you let's see are there are there any other questions uh we we do have time for a few more um someone asked how long did it take to model this simulation so uh with with this specific model, it, it really depends on how the co communication with the uh, stakeholders goes. So as like a presenter before me mentioned that uh, if the people you work with provide you information as fast as you can, then it can be done within a month or two. And uh, like in this, for this project, I think this can be done within a month as long as you have all the input information, but then, and it, but if you don't, uh, then it really depends on how quick you get the, all this information. But I think modeling wise, it, it takes within a month around that, yeah. Thank you. Okay, if, if there are any other questions, again, we probably have time for, for maybe one, possibly two more. Um, Let's see, how, how many uh, modeling and simulation developers were, were involved? Was it just you or were there others? So it, in this, for this model, it was uh, two people. We basically, we figured out that two is the optimal way to work on one model, two people, um, because then you both can keep up with it, keep up with the changes and then verify each other. And, uh, it, it, I think it, it's a bit more difficult to involve more than that for one specific model, because if one person builds up the logic, then all other have to keep up. And with two, it was a bit more optimal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and most of the projects we do are just in groups of two, I think. That's understandable. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of continuing on that, actually, a, a great question just came in. So how many simulations do you do, like, for example, in, a, in an average year? Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on uh, our internal customers. If we try to kind of balance them so we don't do too many and we kind of have uh, time to finish one project and focus on one project and then take another one. So we may, if, if there is always a constant supply of projects, then we try to uh, postpone them or keep them uh, for later and then it really depends on that, basically. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and because we work uh, internally only within Malex, and uh, we work only with 
only with Malex pretty much. And as I, as I mentioned, we're from the automotive unit and we work with uh, automotive business unit uh, manufacturing facilities. And then only if we are done with uh, the automotive projects, then we can look at uh, projects from other business units <laughs> mm -hmm. in our group. Yeah. It sounds pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Um, let's see. We, we have one more question that came in. I think we have enough time for that. So uh, last question for you. Um, how does Molex select projects for simulations? Is there a particular hierarchy or, or um, you know, decision tree that you go through? Uh, yeah, I think it's similar as uh, other presenters mentioned before. We at first try to evaluate if a project needs a simulation at first. Uh, sometimes the simulation isn't really necessary and we at first evaluate that and then we determine what kind of tools we need to do if we conclude that we need to simulate something. Then we try to kind of discuss what tools, what tools are the best to use in order to simulate something. Yeah, something like that. Excellent. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, I, I appreciate this. Uh, this this was a, an excellent a uh, lot of lot of excellent insights into the simulation work you're doing. Um, so I, I appreciate you uh, coming on and and presenting this today. Yep. Thank you.